The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. What's up, everybody? Welcome into episode three of season five of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your stuffy host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factor Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thank you all for listening so much to the show. If you haven't already, make sure you write a review. Give us a five-star rating over on iTunes or Spotify. And if you're not following our YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe and like the episode there. Uh, Thank you for your patience. Last week, I was was really gung-ho about being back on a weekly production schedule for the show but then i forgot that we had to go to pay six and my week was cut into a third and we had a bunch of warehouse work to do before we left so i couldn't get the episode out last week and then this week i've been struggling as you can tell with a bit of seasonal post nasal drip so i know how annoying that can sound Um, i'm gonna do my best to keep the talking to a minimum but um, we're here to get episode three out and this week we have a lot to talk about so first of all thanks to simon treasure for our intro theme music for this season and let's get to what's new in the industry. Like I said, last week was PASIC. If you're unfamiliar with PASIC, it is an acronym for the Percussive Art Society International Convention. It's held every November, and for the past handful of years and for the next handful of years, it'll be at the pay, uh, Percussive Art Society headquarters in Indianapolis, Indiana. And what it is, it's essentially Thursday, Friday, Saturday with some things happening on Wednesday, just 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. or later of all sorts of drum drum and percussion performances, clinics, master classes, workshops, um, everything you can imagine, uh, open jams and drum circles, not just drum set, there's percussion, classical percussion, marching percussion, there's contests, there's competitions, uh, percussions from all around the world, African percussion, um, Asian percussion, drum set playing. Uh, technology, so it is it is all encompassing, and then there's also an exhibit hall where manufacturers can display their products. So this was the first year that Drum Factory Direct exhibited, so we were super excited to have our booth set up. We took a few boxes of our practice pads and some sticks and some drum heads and all of our new T-shirts, and um, it was awesome. But I lost my voice, and I think that's what's contributed to this stuffiness in my head. But it was an amazing show. I think I'll do a more detailed recap on the experience next week, hopefully when I can talk a little bit better. But it was truly it was truly a pleasure. I got to meet a handful of podcast listeners in person, which is always amazing. I'm always reminded of how important PASIC is for just humanizing and bringing everybody together and you know just being able to have a coffee or grab a bite to eat with people that you only know via virtually or via you know email or whatever. It just kind of brings us all together. Um, super awesome experience. There's some highlights. Matt Chamberlain was there. Matt Cameron was there. Rossi Hernandez was there. There were some surprises. Hal Rosenfield talking about how he records for video game soundtracks. Amazing. Obed Calary, amazing. Pocket Queen. Um, it was just, you know, hour after hour, just amazing performances. So if you've never been to PASIC, mark your calendar next November. I don't know the dates, but it's somewhere in the first half of the month. You should definitely be there. As far as non-PASIC news and non-warehouse news, um, I heard that Max Weinberg got let go from Slipknot kind of surprisingly. That was a bit of a shock. I thought he was a perfect drummer for that band. Very curious as to what ends up happening with Slipknot moving forward, so we'll keep an eye out for that. Uh, I just saw that Adam Deitch put out a new record, which is an organ-based funk quartet, I believe, and he has some, some special guests. I think Scofield's on it. That just came out. It's fantastic. Adam is cream of the crop for, for groovy funk soul jazz. Go check that out. Um, I saw uh, Jimi Hendrix. There's like a live record that came out from 67 that just got released. Really wild where they were talking about essentially playing their new songs, which was like fire and along the watchtower and all that. So that's all available now if you need some music to check out. Certainly go support Adam Deitch, former podcast guest, great guy, one of my favorite drummers. All right, let's get to our featured segment. We have the return of the great Kenny Washington. We had Kenny Washington on the show a few episodes, uh, maybe a few seasons ago. Thomas Went came over and interviewed Kenny, and it was great. And we got so much good feedback, and everyone said, bring him back, bring him back. So here we are. We actually have two episodes in a row with Kenny because the conversation went pretty long, and I don't want to edit any of it out. Kenny's just such a, such a wealth of knowledge and experience, amazing educator. He's, you know, he's been in the scene, the, you know, the... 
He was one of the young lions that, that, that popped up in the late 70s that were working with all these legacy artists, most uh, notably Betty Carter's band. You know, so his career is connected deeply with the bebop roots of jazz and where it went from the 70s to now. Great educator, uh, incredible wealth of knowledge about all the documented versions of jazz on record. He's a radio show host. So, and Thomas is a, a former student and a, and a friend of, of Kenny's, so they, they get deep into it right away. We're kind of talking about Kenny's career a little bit in this one, and it goes where it goes. So here's part one with the great Kenny Washington. All right, folks, thank you so much for joining us again on another edition of the Drum Candy Podcast. And as I said today, we are welcoming back for part two, one of the baddest guys around, the great Kenny Washington, Uncle Wash. Thanks for coming back, man. Mr. Wind, how are you, sir? <laughs> I'm doing good, man. Great to see you in uh, in the vinyl room on the second floor of uh, the Shea Wash castle, castle man. <laughs> How you feeling? Oh, everything is okay. How about you? I'm good, man. I'm good. So last time, I can't, I can't believe it, man. The last time we did one of these was almost a year ago, which is incredible. Wow, man. Good I know, man. Yeah, time time flies. And last time we were talking about a lot of your your early development and your early career. And I thought today maybe we could focus on uh on some of the records that you're on since you're on, you know, several hundred. Uh, there were there were a few that I wanted to talk about and sort of some of the things um, that you've learned from some of the great masters that you've worked with uh, thus far in your career. Is that cool? Yeah, it's fine. Beautiful. So why don't we go back to not the very beginning of your recording career, but one of the first records that you're on, and that is uh, the now classic Betty Carter, uh, The Audience. Uh, recorded at the Great American Music Hall in, in 79. You were with Betty for about two years or so, is that right? Well, I joined her in September, uh, September of 78. Okay, and then you were with her till about 1980 or so? Yeah, matter of fact, yeah, January. Okay. Because right as when we made that record, well, right after that, or not shortly after that, that's... Well, yeah, I guess shortly after that, that's when the the band meant more or less broke up. Gotcha. It was earlier, earlier in that year. It was definitely earlier in that year, right after we made that record. I don't even think the record was out quite yet. It might have been out, but early February. That's when, um, you know, that's when that's when I left. Gotcha. John John Hicks had already, you know, had split because they had a falling out. <laughs> <laughs> and Curtis stayed, and his replacement, uh, uh, Hicks' replacement, was Mulgrew Miller. That's how I first met Mulgrew. Wow. Did you play any gigs with Betty and Mulgrew, or, or no? No, and I almost stayed. Yeah. I almost stayed with Betty because I wanted to play with Mulgrew. Of course, years later, Mulgrew said, yeah, man, I can hear him now. Yeah, man, I know why you left. You left because I was playing so sad, man. That's why you left. I said, no, no, that at all, man. You know, but but I had been with that with Betty long enough. I wanted to do something else, and that's when that's when uh, uh, Ronnie Matthews had called me to to play with, with with Griff because I was asked to play with Griff Griff two other times before that. So I figured the third time's a charm, man. You know, I'm gonna leave <laughs> Betty play with Griff, but. Um, I made a couple of rehearsals. I made a couple of rehearsals with Mulgrew, man. And and I remember that when he, you know, she she heard about him through Mercer Ellington. Right. Mercer Ellington Orchestra. And so she contacted him. And, and so he came to her house for a rehearsal. You know, gotcha. rehearsal audition. And and I remember when he sat down at the piano because, you know, there was there wasn't any music. You know, because Hicks had all, John Hicks had all that stuff up in his dome, you know. Yeah. And so she had some music, but it was all messed up and everything, you know. Yeah. And Mogru came in there, man, and iced those parts, man. And I remember when he first started playing, the smile on her face, it was like, <laughs> you know. But, yeah. Uh, I never played it. I never played any gigs with him, but 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 you were saying, oh, sorry. I, no, no, I, no. That's okay. That's all right. So 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 let's let's go back to to just your 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 time with Betty. So as as a young drummer, before we get to 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 the audience recording, 
what were some of the things that you learned from from working with her as a as a young drummer and a, just a young musician in general? She taught me a lot about control, control of the instrument. She would play she would play tempos, man, that were unbelievably fast. And then the next tune right after that would be something incredibly slow. Mm. And and and, and all I I still remember this. Like her, one of the numbers she would play would be like trolley song or my favorite things. And see, so when the, the tune would end and we had finished and the audience would be applauding, see, so I knew the next tune would be a ballad. And I never forget just putting my hands, just switching from, and I'm gonna switch from the sticks to the brushes. And I remember just, she's talking to the audience. It's just, I just put my hand down on the snare drum and the floor tom tom. And I felt like I had the St. Vitus dance. You know what they used to go to dance? I, I was like, <laughs> like I was nervous, <laughs> you know. And then, but then the next number was going to be a ballad. And with her, there was no sweeps on the brushes, you know. See, so she didn't want you to play, you know, time with the brushes on the snare drum. She didn't like that at all. She wanted that open space. So what she wanted you to do was to play the ride cymbal on beats one and three and the hi-hat on two and four. So it would be ding, ding. That's all she wanted to hear. But that was the easy tempo to play, man. She would have it in here. Ding, ding. And 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 man, you don't want to rush or get or, or be late for each beat. I mean, because she would give you one of them looks. And the thing was, man, I mean, even from the beginning, she would she had a way, she wouldn't count off the tempo either, mm. being that tempo. She had this, she had this thing like where she would she, her arm, her 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 fist would be up in the air. And then she would bring her arm down, and when her fist was parallel with the floor, bam, that was the downbeat. But to make it even harder than that, you had to feel the space between the first and second beat. So in other words, the tempo could be one, two, three, four, or it could be one, two, Three, it could be anything, man. You know, and so you had to feel that space between, you know, that first and second beat so that you could come in on that, so you could come in on that second beat. And mm. you better not be late either. Or you better <laughs> not you better not be early. You know, she would give you one of them looks, you, you know, just she would turn around and give you one of them looks, and you felt like a, you were shot with a machine gun. You felt like Swiss cheese, man, you know. Um <laughs> Yeah. So I learned a lot about control, you know, how to go from one tempo, how to go from one tempo to the next, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I learned about endurance mm. playing fast because she had some tunes like where she would, you know, I mean, the tempos would be fast and she would sing on those tempos and she really could sing. Betty had great time, man. Mm -hmm. That was the best thing about her was her time. You know, how she would phrase either, you know, either as a ballad or or, or, or those up tempos. Mm. I mean, she would she would like on a ballad. Of course, you know, you get to know the lyrics of these tunes. And sometimes her time she would lag and she would be so far behind. And then somehow or another, you know, uh, because of her rhythmic sense, she would fit all those words in and they might be coming up into the top of the chorus. Bam. It was unbelievable, man. Mm. You know, that was for me, that was the best thing about her was, you know, her time, you know, and how she, you know, her phrasing, you know? Yeah, yeah. When 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 it came to to dynamics, did you find that you had to really sort of develop the ability to play a lot softer with her, or was it was it kind of was it kind of muscular or, 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 or dynamically? What was it like? It was all the above. Yeah. You had to watch her. 
you know, and she had these different moves and you knew when to, you know, when to bring it down or when, you know, she well, she wanted you to play, you know, muscular or strong. So it, it, it was very dynamic. She, she, you know, all these dynamics and everything, uh, she would, you know, she would use, you know, mm. different acts on, you, you know, on different tunes. Wow. So it was amazing, man. I mean, um, and you... And you had to remember, we had enough, you know what, when, back in those days, we had enough tunes in, in the book that if the club owner asked, asked us to play five sets of music, we could play five or six different sets. Mm. You know, she would rehearse. She would, you know, the way she would rehearse the band, um, she had all these ideas, man. I mean. All that stuff that you hear on those records, those are her arrangements. She came up with most of that stuff, or or at least, you know, the beginning of it came from her. And then, of course, it would just develop into something else. And, you know, I would come to her and she had she had like and I don't know the name of this book. I was never able to find out the name of this book, but she had this table she had this like table it was like a small older looking table you know and it had this big book it was like a thesaurus it had this like it was like a a, a thick webster's dictionary a thesaurus and and i don't know she must have had this book since she was a teenager or a kid because i don't know how many pages had been ripped off of that book it certainly didn't have the front cover that is long gone you know <laughs> And <laughs> I mean, because she had used it so much and it had been through so many different places over the years, but this book sat on the table by its lonesome. And this, this, this book had all these different tunes. I wow. mean, just all kinds of, you know, obscure tunes, you know, and she would go in that book and, and she played a little bit of piano and she'd figure out what she which tune was interested would interest her, and then she would sit down and bang on the piano, and I we'd come to rehearsal, or maybe it might be a sound check, and she might already be there, what happened? So she's sitting down there noodling on the piano, and then you know, so she's formulating stuff in her mind, arrangements and things, and I would hear, and then we oh we'd be at her house, and you know she would be playing. And then, and then I might say, Betty, what's that you're playing? Oh, that's just something I'm working on, kid. Okay. And she wouldn't say anything more, you know? And so then it would develop. And then we, we, we and so it'd be another rehearsal, maybe, maybe a day or two later, a week, might be a month. And then she would, John Hicks would be at the rehearsal at this time. And so then she would say, hey, John, check this out. And John would look over her shoulder as she's playing, you know, and he would get an idea. Of course, he would, you know, he would dress the chords up because he's a real pianist. And then she would tell everybody what she wanted or it would work into something. And then next thing you know, with this tune, we'd have an arrangement, be a super hip arrangement too, man. I mean, and so she had all these tunes and we would come up with these new things and so you figure for the next gig, that's what she's gonna. That's what she's gonna play. No, first set she wouldn't play them. No, second set she oh, she should play them. Second set no, no, no. Third set no, no, no. So so well, she'll get to them the next night. No, second night nothing. See, so days the days are rolling by. So you you know then all of a sudden she'll just pull one or two of those tunes out, and you better know it. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. you know she kept my mind sharp yeah you know uh she kept she, you know she kept my mind sharp she was something else man uh -huh. yeah i yeah that's that's amazing did you did you get a chance to solo a lot with her or not no no the only time john hicks john hicks the trio would play two numbers before she came on yeah and best of it it was her show yeah. So I would get a chance to play some with the trio. John would have, you know, trio tunes. But for the most part, after that, it was, you know, it was her show. 
She's yep. the only she's the only vocalist that I know of that could start with a ballad. Mm. And of course, the ballad would be so slow you could have lunch between the beats. You know, she would start her set like that. And she would work her way up. And by the end of the set, her programming and the way she would put tunes together were amazing. Mm. And by the end of the set, the people would be going crazy, yelling for more. She, I mean, I've seen her do that plenty of times. So I learned a lot about pacing. Yeah. You know, she would she would also, you know, we, we would be on the uh, on our way to a club, right? And she would she would say, hey, kid, and she called me kids. And we played this tune last time we was here. And uh, I said, no, I don't think so. No, we didn't play that once. So I said, well, did we play? Do you remember we played this one? I said, yeah. She said, okay, we won't play that one. And then she she would say it constantly. She would say, if, if you're playing the same thing every time you go to a club, you're not thinking. She wanted to have fresh she wanted to have fresh music every time she would go to that club, to whatever the club was. Mm. Of course, there might be people that would request certain things and she would do those. But for the most part, she was into the next batch of tunes. She wanted some new stuff that the audience hadn't heard. And she felt that if you were doing the same stuff, she said, you're not thinking. Which which to me was very interesting that, you, you know, she, you know, she really cared about you know, the audience and the mm. president and music presentation. Sometimes, you know, sometimes she might pick out a set and she would get on the stage and then she would automatically change because of the way the audience felt. She could feel that audience. So what she thought would work, well, when she got on the stage and felt the vibe with the audience. She said, no, that's going to work. Let's play this one instead. Uh, amazing, man. Yeah, that's, amazing. that's, that's real mastery of, of the craft of, of presenting music, which is, I think, you know, there's so many talented young musicians today, but that, that's a rarity to find a young musician who can really present the music in that way, you know? Well, the, see, the thing about it is, you know, all the people that she worked with, she was Lionel Hampton, man, you know, Lionel Hampton is nothing but show business. That's right. I mean, see, so she came from that, you know, from that from, from from that era of whoever she worked with. It was for the people. It was a presentation. They wanted the people to feel good because they're going to buy drinks. They're going to have fun. So that means that they have fun when you come back to the club. I mean, when you, you know, the when, when the club owner's thinking about hiring you, Again, they're going to see how much meat is in the seats. They say, "Oh yeah, well yeah, we'll invite we'll invite them back." The audience really liked them. Yeah, you know, it's not like that anymore, man. You know, I mean, to me, most of these guys are playing for themselves. They're not thinking anything about the audience. And in my opinion, they're holding the audience hostage most of the time, man. You know. Yeah. But as Art Blakey <laughs> used to say. Maybe we wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but getting a chance to play with all those kinds of people, I for myself, I got a chance to see that, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, when you when you guys made that live record, I'm I'm assuming you you probably recorded over a few nights, is that correct? And they kind of took the best of the best. You I, I'm not sure if you even remember that, but yeah, yeah. We were yeah, we were we were at the Great American Music Hall. I mean, we used to play there, uh, Tom Bradshaw's Great American Music Hall in San Francisco. We used to play there quite a bit. Is you that know, right? She, yeah, yeah, yeah. She was she was well loved in San Francisco. And so we would so she decided to make she decided to make a record there with her money. That was wow. her record, man. She booked and in those days it, it was no it wasn't any digital stuff. She had the truck. Wow. Yeah. Had, you know, if you make it, they would have a truck. They had yeah, the remote two, truck, the remote trucks. And this was a big truck, man. You know, I mean, and and, you know, of course, you had to have the the uh, I guess the, the the permission from the city that that was going to be yep. your part space because this truck took up about two to three car lengths. Yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, I mean, she really, she really did it up right, man. And and um, so we recorded on uh, Friday, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I think we recorded three nights. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's stuff that's still there's. I mean, there's still some things that are unreleased. Yeah, man, I would. I'd, I'd love to hear that, man. <laughs> she was thinking about putting. She was thinking about putting out another, another. Uh, wow. Another volume of it, but um, that never happened. From what I understand, in fact, there's a. I guess there's a website called um, Wolfgang's Vault. I yeah. think that's what it. Yep. And and somehow or another, I don't know how they did it, but they had. I, you know, because they have some 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 alternate takes and things from other nights. You know, there's a there's a video, there's some video of that as well. You know, somebody there was a person doing some sort of like doctoral thesis or something on either Betty or jazz vocalist. And there there's some video of you guys, man. Well, there was a guy. He's he's in he was in Philadelphia. He's still around. I saw him about oh man, maybe about four years ago. And he was doing a documentary on Betty. Uh. I saw the documentary, man. I mean, it was incredible. And he was around then. And he filmed, you know, he was he was friendly with Betty and he did an interview with her. And then he uh, and there was an afternoon, you know what? There was a matinee. There was a matinee on Sunday. And what what you see on that video is from the matinee that was done in the afternoon at the great American music hall. That's wow. where that comes from. But there's a documentary that exists. Mm. And um, I saw it, man. I mean, I was at the guy, I was at the guy's house and it's great. And, and uh, he felt that he felt that the, the, the public radio stations and everything, they, they, they were punking him in terms of the amount of money that he wanted, they didn't want to give it to him. So then he said, "Nah, man, I, I you know." Oh, so wow. it never, it, you know, you know, it never came out. And then I saw him again. I and by this time, you know, they the Nina Simone video, uh, a documentary had come out. I saw him again not long after that, or maybe a little bit before that. I said, hey, "Man, you might want to consider, you know, putting this out." And so he had been rethinking about it. And he says, "Yeah, well, maybe." The way I was thinking back then is wrong. Uh, maybe I will do something with it, and I I uh, I tried to help him to get permission from Betty's sons, and and I hooked them up, but I never heard anything more. So I don't. Oh you know. wow! Well, I hope it comes out one day. That would be a wonderful thing for everybody to be able to see. Yeah. Um, so you know, let's 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 move on to uh, to 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 uh, some some more musicians that you've worked with. So, in the earlier parts of your career, I know you played and recorded with both Walter Davis Jr. and Walter Bishop Jr. And yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about working with both of those guys. You've worked with so many of you know the greats as far as jazz pianists go, and those are two gentlemen who. Uh, unfortunately have been as you well know lost to you know to uh you know a lot of the history could you talk a little bit about working let's maybe start with walter davis jr could you start by talking about working with him oh it was great man you know you know walter davis jr studied with walter bishop jr early oh, on i didn't know that that's amazing yeah wow yeah um i'm trying to think of how i i met walter First of all, Walter was such a nice man. I mean, this guy would walk into the room and on a rainy day, he would bring the sun in with it. Mm. He was just a jovial, jovial type guy. And um, working with him, I really, really got into Bud Powell's music. You know, so, so he would, he, I mean, because Bud taught him that music. Bud, and Walter told me that in the beginning, well, well, let's just say that Bud used him, used Walter like a guinea pig to test things out. So he needed somebody. He needed to have somebody to, that he could teach the music to. So he would teach, he would teach, he taught Walter, Walter Davis Jr. music. 
And what Bud would do is like, he would have Walter play it and Bud would just walk around the room. See, so now he's listening to this from a, 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 a listener standpoint. It's one thing to play it, but how does it sound? Mm-hmm. And he would have him play these pieces and then he would stop him at certain points. No, no, no. Put the third in the bass. Let me hear it with the third. The, the third. Let me hear it with the third in the bass. And Walter would play. And Walter would play it. Says, no, 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 no. Keep it like it is. Wow. And they would go would stop him someplace else. And see, so he, you, you know, see, so he learned all these different, all buds, the insides of buds' music. Like I remember, we played uh, Un Poco Loco. And so in the bridge, there's this little piano run that's done with the left hand. I I didn't really realize that. But then when he was teaching the bass player, he said he wanted the bass player. And I said, damn. And then then he would play what was on the top. It was amazing, man. So I got a whole, you know, a a real, a real, an inside view of, 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 the workings of of Bud Powell and how he would play because he learned all that stuff. Later on, Walter Walter told me that he thanked Bud for you know. At first, he didn't like it, but later on, he thanked Bud. And said, "Man, thank you for 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 taking me on and and and, and insisting that I learn your music." But he he had all the insights, man, all the inside wow. voice, everything. In, so in- it was. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, Walt Walter was a great composer himself, and his music is pretty challenging. Could you talk about playing that and learning that stuff? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, because his music had different. His music had different forms. It was yeah. really different, man. I mean, that music was, but it wasn't hard for the sake of being hard. Right after you got it, it it's definitely listenable. But he had a different way of looking at form and tunes, like you know those tunes like uh, Uranus. Yep. You know, and Ronnie's a Ronnie's, dynamite. <laughs> yeah, those tunes, man. You know, uh, what's the Scor- Scorpio, da, Scorpio da, Rising, da, all that da, stuff. Da, 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 da. Uh, oh yeah. Prana, pranayama. Pranayama. Uh, yep. Jody. And, yeah, yeah, man. So, so um, I'm trying to think, man. How did I'm trying to think of how, I don't know how I'm, I can't remember how I met him. Did you guys rehearse or no? Oh yeah. Well, we all had to, yeah, we had to rehearse all that music, man. I mean, he, you know, I'm trying to, I, I'm trying to think he, you know what? I met him because I met him because, because he, I was playing with Lee Konitz at Sweet Basil's and Barry and Barry Harris was playing the gig. Wow. The bass played Piero and myself at Sweet Basil's. And so Barry was playing piano. That's one of the first times I think I ever played with Barry, if not the first time. And so that night, Walter Davis was at the bar having a taste. So Barry was playing. So he, so you know, when the set was over, you know, was hey baby, you know, man, you sound great. La 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 la. We shook hands and everything. Of course, I knew who he was. Like I already had that record Davis cup, you know. So all right, so I go on home. The next night we come back to Sweet Basil's, and Walter was on piano. Wow, Barry gotten sick Barry got sick or something he sent Walter in as a sub so Walter played that night with us Tom Harrow was playing trumpet that is a hell of a band and so when the gig was over Walter you know gave gave me a hug he says man I love I love listening to you but playing with you is even better let me have your number man let me have your number (laughs) I got some gigs coming up, man. And I want to, I want you to, I want to rehearse. And so then that's how I started playing with him. And that music, man, was hard, man. That's how Philly Joe Jones started taking me serious. Ah. That's how Philly Joe Jones started taking me seriously. Because 
you know, he started, Philly Joe started coming back to New York. And of course, I was following him around like a shadow, man. Every time he played at the Vanguard, you know, with Bill Evans or any time he played anywhere in New York City, I was there. And see, so he saw me and we got, we, you know, we got to be friendly, you know. And, you know, so one time I came down to Vanguard. He was playing with Bill Evans. So I had my cymbal bag and walk into Vanguard. So I'm sitting right by the drum corner there, you know. So Joe was setting up his setting up his cymbals. He's sitting on putting the putting the clutch on the hi hat. And so then he sees me. He said, "Hey man, how you doing?" I said, "Joe, I'm doing fine. How are you?" He said, "I'm doing fine." So now he's adjusting his hi hat. And so then he says, um, "So I, I see you have your cymbal bag. Would you have a would you have a gig or something?" I said, no, man, I had a rehearsal with Walter Davis Jr. And he just stopped. <laughs> he, he looked me dead in the eyes. You play with Walter Davis Jr.? <laughs> I said, well, yeah. And he's just looking at me. He said, man, that's my baby. Walter Davis Jr.? He says, hey, man, is he still writing those hard ass tunes? I said, yeah, Joe. In fact, I have a whole cassette of them that I have to use. I have to learn for tomorrow's rehearsal. <laughs> then he looked at me, he says, he says, well, man, if you play with Walter Davis Jr., then you must be a bad mother, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, then, so then he just kept staring. And it, so then after that, he started taking me more serious. This nice. is before he me play then but, but after that you know wow. that was you know sort of kind of his seal of approval man i mean see so that's when we started to get a little closer then you know nice but but uh yeah but playing with him man the, those tunes uh, you know you had the, the forms of those tunes were very different yep. see, so i had to take music home and, and you know and listen to it man you know and then i would play gigs around new york city you know i would play gigs around new york city with him you know was, and the was... same thing uh-huh. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, man. I was just going to ask, was was that cat Tom Barney playing or were there different bass players? Because I know Tom is on that record that you're on. Tom Barney was Tom Barney was playing uh, Tom Barney was playing electric bass. Um, he was supposed to play. You know, that group was supposed to go on the road with Johnny Griffin when Johnny Griffin first came back to America. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. That band trio. Because they were trying to find a trio that could keep up with Griff. <laughs> and they figured that we could do it. Now, see, now, now Tom, I never heard Tom play electric, uh, acoustic bass, but he was supposed to break out the acoustic bass. But that never happened, man, because, because uh, uh, Babs Gonzalez. <laughs> Babs, well, Babs Gonzalez, for those of you who do not know who Babs <laughs> Gonzalez was, he was a, a lyricist, vocalist, uh, comedian, <laughs> median, you know, he did it all. I mean, he was quite a character, man. I mean, he's one of these New York characters. He could talk himself into a deal and then with his mouth, talk himself right out of the same deal. man. <laughs> he, was, he, was, he was classic, man. Huh. But anyway. Walter, Walter Davis Jr. worked with Babs Gonzalez back in the days of three bips and a bop. Yeah. In fact, Walter told me that they would play two to three sets and he would have Monk, Bud, and Walter in the car with them to play this gig. Each one of them played a set. Now, this is what Walter told me. I wasn't there, but that's what Walter told me. That's amazing. Man, you know. <laughs> See, so, of course... Walter, Walter, uh, Walter really respected, Walter really respected uh, Babs. And so I'm not going to mention this person's name, but they were managing. I'm going to be a nice guy today. Today it's not here in New York City. So I'm going to be a nice guy. Not nice is good. But, <laughs> but, but uh, Babs heard about Walter going out on tour with Griff and he heard about this person that was supposed to be managing the whole thing. He calls up Walter and says, listen, man, you got to watch this person. I wouldn't trust them no farther. I could throw them. 
And the night before the gig, Walter called up the manager and asked for all this money up front and a certified check. This is the day before we leave for the gig. Mm -hmm. I had never gone out on the road before. This would have been my first road gig. And so, of course, there were no ATMs or anything like that happened. So that wasn't about to happen. So I got fired before I, he, he said, we the trio. We, I had nothing to do with it. I was fired before I even met Griff, man. <laughs> it would take about two. And then that's when, that's when Ronnie, Ma they called Ronnie Matthews. Yeah. And Ronnie Matthews owed me a favor anyway, because of a messed up gig that happened up in Harlem. And so I, I came home, man. And, and I never, like I said, I'd never gone on the road before. And, and so uh, I remember coming, I was still living with my parents. I remember coming in at the house. When I came in the house, I knew something was wrong, man. <laughs> my mother looked at me. I, so then I said, well, what's wrong? She says, um, Walter Davis Jr. called. He wants you to call him. I said, oh, boy. So then he calls me up, and he didn't tell me the whole story. But I ended up being fired. So then five minutes later, Walter calls me back up. And he says, man, I got a hot tip for you. I just found out that Ronnie Matthews is going to be, you know, is going to be the pianist. And so I said, OK, thanks. So I called Ronnie. Like I said, he owed me a favor. So I called him and he said, well, Wash, it's out of my hands, man. I'm going out there as a pianist, but I'm going to be playing with West Coast Rhythm Section. So he says, if I get in good with Griff, you know, and if I could change, if I could change the group to be the way I want it to be, I'll call you. I said, okay, fine. So, of course, I knew that that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> And then in, the, in that same period, man, within in that same period, within a day, I got a call from Sonny Rollins to play with Jackie McLean and Betty uh, and Betty Carter. Wow. All within the same day or two. And so I was going to play with Jackie. I was going to play with Jackie. And then but he, because he was just coming back out on the scene again, okay. Jackie McLean. So, but then Betty called me because I remember picking up the phone and Betty says, Hi, I'm Betty Carter. How would you like to play in my band? <laughs> I'm just, wow, man, you know. <laughs> so then I was going to play with Jackie, but then Betty called me back up and she says, Jackie McLean? Well, well, he's going to be out here for a little while. He's going to be retired. I got gigs coming up until next year. So that's one of the reasons why I took the gig with Betty. Gotcha. But then I was fired with Griff. And you know, Ronnie did call me up a few weeks later. <laughs> but I already played with, I was already playing with Betty by that time. <laughs> so it would take about two to three years before I would I would end up playing with Griff. But but getting back to Walter, getting back to Walter Davis, man, you know, um, Man, he was great to be around. Um, his music was fantastic. I mean, it really made you think differently because the forms were different. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, you know, he had taken, I mean, because he's one of the great greats who has uh, an unbelievable un understanding of the music of Thelonious Monk as well as Bud Powell. And it's interesting how he took, all you know, he took all that he, and learned all this stuff from those two masters, and of course, Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker, and, and and people like that. And he wrote music. Tad Dammer is another one. He was in the Tad as well. And it's interesting how he developed and learned from those composers, and came up with something that was very bebop, but it was very Walter Davis Jr. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it, it was great. We will wrap up our interview with Kenny next week. But for now, let's get to a little lesson. 
Here's a sticking exercise that's part of my daily routine. Every morning I set aside about 10 minutes to do pad work and I always end with this sticking routine. So it runs through all the most common variations of singles, doubles, and paradiddles and all the inversions. And it does them in a progressive manner. So you start by playing each sticking for two bars, then one bar, and then finally for half a bar. Um, those of you listening to this audio only, it's not going to be the most amazing thing to listen to, but um, if you want to go check out the video version, you'll see what's happening. I'm going to explain what's happening as well. So it starts with uh, two measures of singles, and then you go straight into two measures of doubles. Then you go into two measures of inverted doubles, and then two measures of paradiddles, inverted paradiddles, backwards paradiddles, which starts with a double, and then the fourth paradiddle version, which I guess you could say is an inverted backwards paradiddle. Um, I'll, I'll explain the stickings more in detail. And then you do the whole thing starting with the left hand, two bars. And then when it cycles back around to starting with the right hand, the next time you do one measure of all the variations, right hand lead, left hand lead. And then you finally change every two beats. And that's really where you're testing your dexterity and fluidity. And you can, can you make these stickings like connect and sound smooth and sound musical and relaxed? It's the way I cap off every morning technique practice, and I feel like that kind of gets me set. I'm ready to play. It's challenging. Um, it's musical. So let's get into it. All right, so you start with two measures of singles. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, and then doubles, double, 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 paradiddle. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Then inverted paradiddle, which is right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left. So the double is in the middle. So two bars of that. One, three, four, one, two, three, four. And then you do a backwards paradiddle, which starts with the double. So right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left. Two bars of that. One, two, three, four. And then the final paradiddle inversion, which is right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right. So the double falls on the first and fourth note of each group of sixteenths. So it's right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right. Two bars of that. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then you don't play that extra double at the end to then do the whole thing starting with the left. One, two, three, four. Two, two, three. And doubles. One, two, three, four. Two, two, three. Inverteds. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, and all the paradiddles, paradiddle, three, four, one, two, three, inverted, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, backwards paradiddles, two, three, four, one, I don't know what else to call them, and the last one, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, Again, don't play that double at the end, and then it cycles you back to the right hand. So that's done two bars of each sticking. And then I go straight into playing one bar of each sticking. One, two, three, and change. One, two, three, and inverts. Two, three, four, and then the paradiddles. Two, three, four, change. Three, four, change. Three, four, change. Three, and then left hand. Two, three, Doubles. One, two, three, four. Inverts. Two, three, four. Paradiddles. Inverted. Backwards. And then that last one. And you're back to the top. And this time it's two beats per sticking. This, they really change quickly and there's actually ends up being like a two, four bar at the end to get the cycle to flip back around. So I'll go slower. One, Two doubles, inverted, paradiddle, inverted, backwards, and then that last one, and you're starting over with the left, doubles, inverts, paradiddle, inverted, backwards, and then that final one. 
that two beat cycle took me a while to get comfortable. I felt like it was just, you know, it was almost like the stickings were changing too fast for me to really comprehend. And then once the muscle memory was there, I could get it to flow. And I feel like that is really the finishing touch for like I'm warmed up, I'm ready to go, I can play a gig and my hands are ready to shift between singles and doubles kind of wherever they need to. So I always push the tempo to just see, you know, how fast can I, can I go before it kind of falls off the rails. So just the, the two beat cycle. I mean, that's like a race to the finish. And I think I, I max out at 160, so let's put that on and test myself. I'm gonna do the one bar version, just for time's sake, and then straight into the two beat cycle. Here we go, one, a two, a one, two, three, and. Really trying to relax. Here we go. So, I mean, I'm trying to make sure I'm playing as evenly, the notes are as evenly as possible, and you can't really hear the, the sticking changes, but more importantly, I'm trying to get to a state where my hands are just flowing, and each time I'm trying to relax a little bit more, a little bit more, let the sticks resonate, and then just earlier today, I happened to have one stick in the butt end, and it was like I was exploring not having them sound evenly because they're going to be very different. So there's a whole different sound option there to open my ears to what... to what are the different sounds that live within these stickings naturally. So then when you start applying them to the drums, you know, you won't get freaked out and there's just so much music hiding in these things. Yes, they're technical practice, but there's also a ton of music in them. Even just on a pad, you can hear that. So I was trying to, I was playing them as evenly as I could, like physically knowing that the strokes were coming from the same, relatively the same height and the same velocity. And just letting the fact that my left stick is butt end and my right stick is regular, it, the left stick sounds bigger and louder and there's more resonance. So it's a lot of fun. So again, the recap, quite simple. Two measures of singles, starting with the right hand, Two measures of doubles, start with the right hand, invert your doubles, so it be right, left, left, right, right, for two bars. Regular paradiddles, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. Inverted paradiddles, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left. But I'm just calling backwards paradiddles, maybe there's a better name for them, but start with the double, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, for two bars. And then the fourth version, which I guess you would call an inverted backwards paradiddle. Right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right. Two bars of that, get to the end, cycle it to the left hand, two bars, get to the end, it flips back to the right hand for one bar, left hand for one bar, and then right hand for two beats, left hand for two beats, and stop. Depending on the tempo you choose, it's a couple minutes of a, it's just a nice two minute drill. If you pick like maybe two tempos, it's a good finishing way, good finishing step for your daily technique practice. Give it a shot, let me know what you think, and have fun. Let's hit a couple of listener questions. Here's an interesting one from Sean. I don't know, maybe this is one I'd answered before, or maybe I'd put it on a, on a stack to get to later because I didn't quite know the answer. 
Do you have tube lugs for a snare that have the length needed to use with wooden hoops? Um, so I'm assuming the question is, you want to put bass drum hoops on a snare drum because if you want, if you're just talking wood hoops that are designed for a snare drum, whether they're straight hoops or the like Yamaha style that have the holes drilled into them, those will work with your drum fine. You don't need to worry about your lugs fitting. You just need to make sure the tension ride length is correct, and if it's the straight wood hoops for snare drums, you're going to need to get the claws that go on those. But there should be no issue with the lugs with those at all. They're designed to work with snare drums. Now, if you're trying to put a bass drum hoop on a snare drum, maybe you want to turn a 15-inch snare drum into a tiny bass drum, you will most likely need to either put a few layers of gaskets under the lugs to elevate them from the shell a bit, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend because that sort of destabilizes everything. Or... Uh, there's actually bass drum. You can just replace your snare drum lugs with bass drum lugs, which are designed to be taller, so it will clear a bass drum hoop. That's your best solution. We have a handful of those in tube lug style, so just make sure you get the right one. There's a bass drum version of almost every tube lug that we offer. Um, so that's if you're doing, you know, trying to put bass drum hoops on it. Then you also got to worry about the drum head has to be a bass drum head. So in my, if, if I'm reading what your question is correctly. I would just get wood hoops that are designed for snare drums and you'll have no issue with clearance or any of that stuff. All right, I get a lot of questions about hoops because we did that deep dive on, you know, fixing up a snare drum in season one. And, and I think that got everyone thinking about, well, maybe I should get some new hoops. This one is, I have a Pearl 3x13 Maple Piccolo. Um, you mentioned that you can get an instant upgrade by changing hoops to brass. I've never switched that. Would you switch out the top and bottom? So a wood snare drum, Changing from steel to brass is not going to be as much of a sonic improvement or difference, frankly, to justify the extra cost, because those brass hoops are expensive. If you have a metal drum, putting brass hoops on it gets the whole thing to resonate much you know, more you know, richer sound. So that's I would put brass hoops on metal drums if you're trying to just give a little bit, you know, not actually quite a lot, more flavor and warmth and color to your snare. A wood drum, I think you just need to worry about the thickness and... and and weight of the hoop and then what they're made of versus, you know, steel versus wood. So that drum probably came with standard 2.3s. So I would just fill in the opposites. A die cast batter will make that thing really crack and give you a lot of focus. And then maybe go with a single flange lightweight hoop to open it up. You could do, I mean, in that case, probably top and bottom. So I would get a set of single flange for top and bottom to really open it up and give it more of a vintage kind of sound. And then probably just a die cast on top if you need just some extra smack and attack. Um, an alternative would be get a wood hoop for the top, and then you have that real warm kind of like really vintagey kind of rustic sound. But for a piccolo, that might not be the best choice. I might choke it too much. I would do die cast and then a pair of single flange, and that'll give you a whole bunch of options. All right, it's time for the warehouse pick of the week, and we just put out some new T-shirts. We have uh, fully stocked with the Drum uh, Drum Factory Direct Candy Swirl logo shirt, so even bigger sizes. We have up to two X, and also we have tall versions, so X XL tall and two XL tall, fully stocked. So if you want that, that's the black shirt with the white Candy Swirl logo. And we have a new Drum Candy podcast t-shirt, which has a more reduced version of the logo. It just says Drum Candy with teeth marks. You can see it here. Um, that, my, that our designer, Mark Cubitt, put together for us. So that's a black shirt. We had a lot of requests for, for podcast t-shirts in black. So now we have those and an assortment of sizes, I think, small to 2X. So go get yourself a t-shirt. They're over on Drum Factory Direct, and I'll put them in the link for the show. All right, that's it for episode three. Thanks for bearing with me with my congested sinuses. Hopefully by next week they'll open up a bit more and you won't have to hear me talking like I'm talking through a handkerchief. Um, again, thank you all for listening. Appreciate you. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. Make sure you give us a like and a comment on your podcast player, wherever that is. Um, we definitely could use some reviews. There was one I saw last week. Thank you. We need some more. We want the show to we want the show to rank high, man. We want this thing to live on. So, thanks for your support, and I'll see you next week.